What in the world is supported in part by the World Affairs Council of Greater Reading? Council of Greater Reading is the leading educational organization promoting understanding and enlightenment on global issues. I am Mike Sutton, back once again. We're on a slightly unusual schedule here on Wednesday the 9th at 8.30 p.m., not our regular time, but we'll be back on track next month. This month, I'm very excited to have a great guest in the studio, a fellow board member on the World Affairs Council, professor of political science at Penn State Berks, Dr. Randall Noonan. Well, welcome to the show, Randy. Thanks. Good to be here. Yep. And we're going to talk about a couple things today. We're going to spend probably most of the show on Syria, what's going on there. Mm -hmm. But you have spoken to the council before about Brexit. You gave us a, a nice brief last year on the topic. Just give us a, a quick overview on wh where things stand with Brexit right now. Well, it's looking pretty worrying right now. Um, as people may know, we have uh, only about two months until what's supposed to be the final Brexit, the actual break with the European Union uh, at the end of March. And at this point, things are very unsettled and people are looking at the worrying possibility of what they call a hard Brexit which means the Great Britain will just stop overnight being a member of the European Union. Uh, the British government has been starting to do things like practicing uh, for huge traffic jams by lining up you know, dozens of, of uh, trucks on the major highways to see how they would deal with, with uh, suddenly the border being closed and every single person and every single truckload of goods having to be checked at the borders. Um, and just kind of for a little perspective, uh, a lot of people think of this as being something like perhaps uh, what Mr. Trump is proposing on the southern border, like are, we, oh, are they just going to add some more border checks or something. But uh, it's, it's in some ways more like uh, suddenly Pennsylvania and New Jersey being different countries overnight because these, you know, the European Union has uh, had no passport checks. Uh, no customs checks at all uh, on goods, and all of a sudden it's as though the Delaware River bridges just become a, a border uh, between two states, and you've got you know people living on opposite sides, and it's just a huge amount of potential complications that are uh, re really worrying. How hard a deadline is this two months? Is there flexibility there, or that's it? <laughs> well, that's one of the big questions. The European okay. Union has a reputation for sort of muddling through, and one possibility is that they will reach some kind of a compromise on what's called a soft Brexit, where there will be some kind of a transitional agreement that will let things run a little more smoothly, um, or they'll reach some agreement to just kind of kick the can down the road a little further uh, and temporarily. Uh, or another possibility that's increasingly being discussed is they may do a revote, because the initial vote to leave was really pretty close. Mm -hmm. And uh, it may be that with all this chaos, there's now enough people in Britain that would just say, okay, let's just forget the whole thing. Um, and, and so that's another possibility. And it's, but it's, uh, you, you can imagine if you were uh, living in Britain or especially if you're a British company that's trying to navigate this, I mean, companies don't like to have, well, in two months, everything may change. Yeah. And that, uh, you know, you've got banks and insurance companies and, and things like that that are starting, some of them are starting to move their operations out of Britain because it just doesn't look like a stable place. There's real worries for the British economy. I mean, you can imagine if you're a British citizen, is this a good time to buy a house? Is this a good time to buy a car? Yeah. Um, and if everybody says no, then that in and of itself yanks down the economy, even even if you don't have the bad yeah, consequences. It sounds like there's a so. lot still really up in the air. So yeah. we'll probably have to have you back again later yeah. in the air for another update. <laughs> yeah. So I, I want to spend a lot of the show today on Syria uh, in the news lately because of the withdrawal. Um, it, it just, I mean, it strikes me as a really kind of confusing situation. So, so maybe to get started, let's, like, high level overview, 
how, how we got here, where we are right now. So uh, the problem in Syria is an outgrowth of the Arab Spring movements that uh, you know some of the viewers may know about in uh, 2010, 2011, 2012. There were a lot of uprisings in the, uh, in the Arab world, including in Egypt and other countries. Uh, and in most of the countries, it was resolved one way or another. Either the movement for change won out, as it did in Libya, as it did in Tunisia, or the government was able to put down whatever demonstrations and revolts there were, and it was resolved. Uh, but in Syria, uh, the opposition, the, the, the rebels were strong enough to not be put down, but the government was strong enough to not give up either. So they've been stuck in a halfway situation for now seven years or more, uh, where the country has really shattered like a expensive Ming vase dropped on the floor into pieces, and, and parts of Syria are still controlled by the original Syrian government. Parts of Syria were controlled by a whole range of different opposi opposition militias, some of them uh, very radical Islamic, some of them more pro-Western and democratic. Uh, and uh, you know, if you look at a, at a map of Syria, it, it looked something like a jigsaw puzzle. And, and that's been the, the confusing situation for, for some years now. And this is all just within Syria. There's other parties involved, and I have a couple categories. The first is the other countries, right? So right. the U.S., uh, Turkey, Israel have positions there. Iran is invested. Russia is invested. Uh, you know, yeah, Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states. Proxy yeah. war. Which, right. I mean, uh, all of these external actors kind of have their own favored groups within Syria. So the Syrian government has been being backed by Iran and being backed by the Russians. Um, the main Syrian uh, Islamic opposition forces have been being backed by Saudi Arabia, by the Gulf states, somewhat by Turkey. Um, and then the United States has its own favorite actors there, too. We've been working with uh, mainly a Kurdish-led militia in, in kind of northeastern Syria that's been trying to combat the Islamic State forces that, that we especially don't like, that have been very anti-Western and uh, causing a lot of global terrorism. Uh, so, you know, each group has their own favored uh, faction, and, uh, you know, how you put that back together is is not easy to see. Yeah. And yeah. then, you know, the most invested party, the people who actually live in Syria and the refugee crisis that's developing or, or developed <laughs> well underway. Right. Yeah, I mean, it's it's gotten to the point where about half the population of Syria has left, which is which is just amazing. I mean, you can imagine if we had a situation in the US that was so bad that 150 million people were fleeing the country and that's kind of the the level that things have reached in Syria. Um, and it could actually get worse because the, uh, what's been happening is the Syrian government has been, in the last couple of years, starting to win the war, starting to reconquer the areas that the different militias had, and every time they do that, they drive out another group of people. And so, uh, you know, there could even be more refugees but before this thing is over, which is, which is really scary for the world. And, uh, especially for the neighboring countries that have been uh, having to house these millions of refugees. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, there's also like a, a commercial aspect of this, right? The military industrial complex that Eisenhower warned about. It's a series of oil producing countries. So there's an interest by the oil companies. How do you think that is impacting the whole situation? Well, it probably makes it even harder to resolve because I know, for example, when the Islamic State was occupying part of eastern Syria and part of western Iraq, they were relying a lot on the oil resources that were there. Kind of whoever gets the oil then has, the, has money and power and influence. Um, so the different factions are jockeying for who gets that. Uh, and of course, you're right, the oil companies want to have an interest in that. And, uh, you know, uh, military sales have be, been a big issue in the area. I mean, uh, people probably remember that when there was this horrible killing recently of the uh, Saudi Arabian journalist Khashoggi, uh, 
when President Trump looked at the situation and said, well, you know, it's too bad that this journalist was killed, but they, they buy a hundred billion, they have a hundred billion dollars in contracts for American arms. So, you know, sort of what is the life of one journalist against a hundred billion dollars in, in arms contracts? And it's, it's distressing to think that that's, maybe that's realistic. I don't know, but a lot of people were, you know, sort of horrified by the idea that that's the way we look at things. Are uh, you up for taking a question from a caller? <laughs> oh, we have a caller. Excellent. Yeah, that's good. Go. Yeah. Do you have the caller? You ready? I'm ready. Let's go. Okay. Go. Being that we are reflecting upon World War One, being that it's the hundredth anniversary of the end of World War One, if World War One had not happened, or if it the Treaty of Versailles had been worded differently and some of the provisions of that treaty had not been enacted, would we be talking about the Middle East and all of this turmoil that has been going on all of my life? As a child, I remember the Suez Crisis. I'm going on 73. It's been present in my life since I can remember. What, what are your thoughts on that? I guess it does save a lot of time for the newspaper headline writers that they can always just keep a headline in stock that says Mideast in crisis and slap that in. You, all, you can always use that. Um, but you're right, probably a lot of the listeners don't, don't realize that, but a lot of these questions, well, a lot of the questions go back well before World War I, but as, as you mentioned, at the end of World War I, what had been the Ottoman Empire in that whole region was carved up into rather arbitrary countries uh, that many of which had never been countries before. Um, and there, there's actually some funny stories about how strangely some of the borders were drawn. One, there's, a, there's a little notch, supposedly, along the border between Jordan and Saudi Arabia in the middle of the desert. There's nothing there. Just the border suddenly jogs for a few miles, and that's called Winston's Hiccup, that little point, because the story is that uh, Winston Churchill was drawing the borders between these countries after drinking a lot of brandy at his gentleman's club uh, one afternoon, and he just got a little unsteady drawing the border, and, and that's been the border ever since between those countries. So I've never heard that story. Uh, you know, it's just, yeah. it's, it's, I, some people say that's not true. That's one of these kind of legendary stories about the region. It but sounds it just, true. <laughs> it's, it's just, uh, it just shows, I mean, and you look at a place like Syria, it's like, does this even belong together as a country? A whole bunch of people who hate each other and have different religions, and uh, it just seems like it was set up to fail. Um, so yeah, that that really did uh, did help to to kickstart the excitement there, and that's uh, and of course when you it, many many people in America then then say, well, you know, this this place is a mess. Uh, it, what do we even need to be involved there? I mean, Mr. Trump actually uh, had a a quote recently where he said, you know, what do we need to be involved in Syria for? There's nothing there but sand and death, um, which was kind of picturesque, but, uh, but you know, it's also such a strategic region, the oil resources right in the center of, of these contending countries, and, and so it's, it's hard to just walk away from either, so. But th yeah. Thanks for the question, Carl. Yeah. So, I mean, is it just a perpetual crisis? What, what's keeping it going right now? Well, I, I guess it's, uh, it's in the interest of some of the countries to have it be a crisis, and uh, and we just have we just have such disagreement over uh, who the legitimate and positive forces in the region are. Uh, for example, the way the Russians look at it uh, in Syria, the the Assad government is is the good guys. They're, they're they bring stability. They're opposed to uh, the the terrorists, um, and we tend to look at it pretty differently. We look at them as basically being the rather terroristic and and. Uh, you know, so there's these fundamental disagreements on, uh, <coughs> you know, who the legitimate forces are and, yeah. you know, who should be in charge. And I think we probably yeah. saw some of that even play out in Iraq where we fought for democratic elections, but then maybe weren't so thrilled with the result we got. Right. Yeah, that, that has happened in some of these countries. Uh, in Egypt, for example, at the end of the uh, 
uh, Arab Spring, where you know the people tried so hard to get a democratic government and then got one that uh, you know we weren't sure was so democratic. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it's it's one of those reasons why I often say I'm glad I'm just studying politics rather than having to be president. You know, <laughs> because it's. Uh, it, there's some tough decisions out there. Easy, easier yeah. from this side. And there, there has been talk of the withdrawal. That's probably a big part of what's been in the news lately. But then I kind of vaguely also have this sense that maybe it was a declaration without consequence. But then at the same time, Mattis resigned over it. So right. w is that actually happening? Is it just something we have to ramp up to? What's the... Well, I think I think withdrawal. I think we're still suffering somewhat from kind of a, a Middle Eastern syndrome. Sort of, a, you know, our our caller was uh, uh, remembers some of these previous wars, and for for many years in the U.S., we seem to have kind of a Vietnam syndrome after all the problems with the Vietnam War, and uh, people just had a feeling of you know we just can't be involved in that sort of thing anymore. And after you know plunging into the Iraq War, plunging into the Afghan War which, you know, seemed justified at the time, but then, you know, here it is all these years later, we're still there. I think that's made many people, probably including the president, very skittish about any other commitments. So even though we only have 2,000 troops in Syria at the moment, uh, and the, I don't think they've suffered a lot of attacks yet, we've been pretty lucky there, uh, I think he just has a feeling of, you know, we don't need to be involved in a third country and let's just get out of there. And uh, sentiment I probably share too. Yeah. <laughs> but there was some pushback to right. it. You know, we announced that we were going to withdraw. Turkey had an opinion. Israel had an opinion. How's that playing out? Well, um, at the moment, it's uh, the um, Bolton, the national security advisor, has been touring the Middle East, basically telling people, no, we're not going to withdraw right away. Um, because there's this feeling that it's such a delicate balance there. If you suddenly pull out, well, what does that cause? It causes a chain reaction of possibly some very bad things happening. Um, <coughs> so there's a, I think there's a, a, a large feeling in kind of the, the, the Defense Department, the national security community, that you don't want to just pull out of there. Um, I think it can be seen as kind of, uh, although uh, Trump doesn't mean it this way, of course, but it could be seen as kind of cutting and running. You know, uh, we, we, we got what we want, okay, we're out of here, and, uh, and leaving behind the people that have been fighting with us, and they're going to be in a very perilous position. The, the groups that we were supporting now are going to be surrounded by Syria on one side and Turkey on the other, both of which would like to get rid of them. And uh, there could be some really nasty things happening when we pull out with the people that we were supporting. And that's, uh, you know, that's, it's not just worrying for this situation, but what kind of a signal does that send to other people around the world? Oh, the United States will support you uh, until we suddenly decide to pull out and we're not supporting you anymore. Um, that's not real encouraging for countries that might want to work with us. But, I mean, what's the alternative? It's been going on for years. There's no end in sight. It's an untenable situation. How, who knows how it plays out, but w what are the signals? What are we looking yeah, for? Yeah, it's like, a, you know, what, what's the exit strategy, as yeah. we have said with some of these wars? Um, so, I mean, I think the hope would be <laughs> that, you know, if we, do, we do, are supporting these forces that control about 30% of Syria, you know, can we leverage that into something um, and say, okay, we're not going to leave until this happens and this happens and that happens and try to get a more positive outcome. Um, that's the hope anyway. I mean, but, even that would take some stability to set up. Right. Are, is there hope for that in sight? What, what, what even could lead to the point where we're in a position to make declarations like that? Right, because at the moment we're not terribly involved in the, in the decisions there, which is... I think too bad. I mean, we've, we traditionally we've been a big power in the Middle East, and <clears throat> on this Syria crisis, we seem to have really left it to Russia and Turkey to decide, and that's uh, you know not really the traditional American role. But yeah. how, how has that affected our relations with some of those countries? Well, I mean, as I was saying about you know our relations with the immediate our immediate allies in, within Syria, I mean, you wonder. Um, What's Iraq going to think? We've traditionally supported them. What's the Afghan government going to think? I mean, the president announced recently, you know, oh, we'll just cut our troops in half in Afghanistan. 
and the Afghan government was like, wait a minute, I mean, we're, we're relying on that for our survival, literally our personal survival in some cases. Yet you at know? the same time, most and, the people there don't even know how it all started, why we're there in the first place. Right, yeah, so it's, um, you know, there's, there's some real dilemmas there, and that's, uh, it's, 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 it's hard to know what exactly you should do, but it's, uh, it, it is a part of the world where it's, it seems to me it's dangerous to be making quick and sudden decisions. And, um, you know, you feel a little bit like uh, the country's a bull in a china shop, and yeah. these are some, some delicate things that could be broken. But, yeah. Uh, so so we've, we've got a lot of things going on. We've yeah. got the trade war with China. We've got the, the, our relationships with Russia. We've got Brexit. You know, like, do, do you see common threads? Is the situation in Syria bleeding over into any of these other areas, North Korea, South Korea, the way we handle those policies? Or well, it's, it's funny that there are a lot of interconnections. I mean, for example, the Syria crisis is really very connected to Brexit. Um, because one of the, the things that really has been breaking the European Union the last several years is Syrian refugees. Um, refugees from elsewhere, too, but the Syrians have been the biggest component uh, where, where suddenly it seems there's these millions of people rushing to try to get into Europe. And, and one of the big principles of the European Union has been once you're in the European Union, you can go anywhere. That's the advantage of the open borders, advantage in most cases, uh, but if you have a bunch of possibly unwanted refugees, that's been one of the big reasons the British have wanted to leave, is that they, they have this feeling that we've joined this group that suddenly is open to the world and letting all these people in, and, and as an island, we're, we're, we don't want that. So um, it's funny, you know, it, often one crisis will be connected to another, even though it's, uh, it's pretty far away. Yeah. And that's, that's one, of the, one of the interesting things about the world, so... Yeah. So I love having you on the show. We've had a couple of your students on the show. Good. F phenomenal guests to the show. Yeah. Anybody from your whole crew is welcome back anytime. And I definitely want to get you back on for, to get deeper into Brexit. You, you said you also have interest in, in uh, sanctions and how that in influences policy. I, but good. we Thanks, do need Mike. to take yeah. a look at some upcoming events from the World Affairs Council. Very good. Um, our breakfast a week from today. Breakfast event, Vaccinations and Global Health with, with uh, Tracy Schreier. And that's going to be a breakfast meeting that we hold at the Wyomissing Restaurant and, Wyomissing Restaurant and Bakery. These are uh, $10 yep. for breakfast, and it's a 7.30 a.m. presentation. Those are usually pretty good. Uh, then we look out to February, and we'll have a presentation on Cuba by Dr. Robert Portada. And that'll be at our regular luncheon location, the Inn at Reading. The doors open at 11.30. It's a nice opportunity to get there and uh, get your food and settle in before the presentation starts. And then I'll skip ahead to uh, next month. We'll be back on our regularly scheduled date and time. So Tuesday, February 5th at 7 p.m. I'll have David Carroll in the studio. David Carroll is the past president of the World Affairs, immediate past president of the World Affairs Council. And we're going to talk about what he refers to as the hidden gem of the World Affairs Council, which is our great decisions uh, s series of events that a lot of, lot of great uh, community organizations involved in. Today, we actually just had a lunch with uh, John Weidenhammer. Right. Great event, community leader, uh, talked about business and entrepreneurship. What would what, you take away from that? Well, it was amazing. He, he did a good overview of the, uh, some of the global trends in technology and how much the world is changing, which, I mean, we all know in the abstract, but he had some good examples of areas um, where, where these new technologies are really changing our lives, but also changing, you know, how we do business um, and, and, and so many other things. He saw it as, a, he said, a real inflection point where, where everything seems to be changing now, and that's, uh, that was, was really striking. And, yeah. I, I really like the point that he made about how as much as things have changed in the past decade, two decades, based on the Internet and technology, technological advancements, he sees that really as the beginning, not the end. And it reminded me very much of, um, there's a Peter Diamandis book, uh, singularity where he talks about how 
technology is going to advance to the point that it just basically solves all our problems. So hopefully it works out <laughs> quite that nicely. I don't know if it's ever really that clean. No, maybe I'll just drive home in I my self-driving car after this. Huh? Sure, yeah. I mean, at some <laughs> point we're going to have to think about how all the automation and self-driving <laughs> technology, all these things are impacting us. But we're out of time for today. Thanks again for Very joining good. me today, Randy. Really appreciate getting into the conversation. See everybody back here next Tuesday, uh, February 5th at 7 p.m. Thanks for watching tonight. What in the world is supported in part by the World Affairs Council of Greater Reading.